at the center of this exhibition are these rolls of paper that were like, they're somewhat like a an artifact produced by the work um, post hoc, which was New Zealand's National Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2019. So it's kind of a relic or an artifact that the work produces over the course of the seven months. And it's um, it's about, I think it's like 12, 10 to 12 kilometers of paper, printed paper of a list of names of things that have vanished, disappeared, gone, become extinct. And revisiting the project uh, here at the Adam Art Gallery has, yeah, it's been quite confronting in a way because the project finished and opened in Venice a year ago, almost to the day. I think it's taken me that long to sort of catch my breath after the event and all of that kind of work um, and intensity that that project um, represents for me. I really think about them as a work. I've enjoyed thinking about them in the last few days during install and, and talking about them as uh, being like locked up language. They kind of hold their own as a kind of form or a mass of the language that is at the heart of the project that is, that is now kind of in this kind of spent form um, the paper is quite used and um, handled, um, and uh, you know it's been it's been sort of sitting in Venice on the floor for for the the length of the exhibition. And so I'm really I really am thinking about it as a, as a work in its own right that sits alongside or next to the project as a as more of a, which is more of a kind of a temporal event that unfolds as it's been exhibited. My interest in in the document extends into that locked up relic that is generated by post hoc. And what's been really interesting in putting this exhibition together is just sort of discovering this thread of an ongoing interest that that stretches into the past in relation to work that I've been making since I was in my early 20s when I was actually still as an undergrad student. One of the works in the show was started when I was still at art school. It takes the form of a document, it's a letter um, or it's a sequence of letters that uh, that really, yeah. Also, they they relish in the kind of aesthetics of the document as a that, something that I recognise in certain art histories. So you know, thinking about certain lineages of conceptualism that use language and text, but also it, the way it sort of um, hides or impinges on the everyday, in that letters, perhaps now a slightly antiquated way to communicate at the time. Are a, um, were a, a form of um, of connection of communication. The letters, you know, are, are documents um, that point to an engagement with some other kind of force. So, in the same way that the post hoc work might be a relic in its kind of in a sculptural sense, those um, those earlier letter works also operate in that way, whereby there's a lot of concealed negotiation or information or withheld um, process that that the document points to. There's a, there are some works from 2005 um, and uh, they are titled Line Breath Drawings. They are hand-drawn A4 documents essentially I've sort of mimicked the the layout of a of a conventional um, legal pad and then I have spoken onto those um, onto those pieces of paper. So in the middle there is this there's a kind of stain or a sort of residue of breath in a sense. Um, and they uh, they have had um, secrets read to them. They hold language in another way um, for me. And you know, thinking about uh, this the, the the breath and voice and the mouth as a kind of a, a tool for the production of meaning certainly as it relates to ideas or conceptualism is, is something that I was thinking about at the time. And so, yeah, these works sort of hold language in an impossible, um, an impossible way. I think what this exhibition has kind of shown, reflected back at me, is an ongoing interest that I've had in this tension between revelation and concealment. So. At the moment that something's revealed to you through a material or, a, or a, um, a title or a process that you see in a work, um, so there's something revealed and yet there's, there's all this kind of, uh, there's all these levels of concealment that are occurring throughout these, these works that stretch quite a large period of time. So 
I think in that tension between revelation and concealment, there's a really interesting proposition for the viewer, which is that they get entangled in the possibility of the work. So there's a work in the in the exhibition that um, yeah dates back to 1998, and I was uh, in my fourth year of uh, my undergrad degree, and I lost my bag. I left it on the bus. You know, I was I was taking the bus to art school, and I absentmindedly left it on the bus, and it had things in it. It was a you know it was a kind of disaster in a way. Um, it was a small personal disaster, and um, so I was in, I was making works at the time that were engaging with various art institutional kind of systems, and so I had the idea of registering this loss with um, an organisation based in London called the Art Loss Register, and they're a private company that track missing and stolen artworks, antiques, or antiquities mainly, antiquities and artworks. And so I paid a small fee to have my bag registered on the art loss register and received, you know, confirmation of this and that this was also, you know, the first artwork um, of New Zealand origin to be in their system, in, this, in their database. And so that's in 1998. Um, Move forward to 2019 in Venice, um, one of the lists um, uh, as, as part of post hoc is a list of um, missing artworks, lost artworks. And I worked with the Art Loss Register. They were incredibly generous partners in some senses, and they provided me with their database um, as part of the project. And so spoken in Venice and printed here in the show and you know, entrapped in these roles, is my lost school bag from 1998. So um, yeah, it just was a lovely connection, both um, by way of you know an object that's missing, that's gone, but also through uh, through such a stretch of time, you know, nearly well 21 years. So um, yeah, that was a that was a really beautiful discovery that Tina and I made together. What was I trying to do in that early work? I mean, I was I was young. And, you know, there's a mischievous kind of quality to that work that, that, I, that I still find really interesting. Um, I think that work could only be, in a sense, be made by a person of the age that I was, my early 20s. There's a kind of, there's an attitudinal force in that work that's about kind of pushing up against um, bureaucratic systems and indeed manipulating those, um, uh, the conventions of the way that, uh, institutions and individuals kind of engage with um, bureaucratic forms and 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 so yeah I think I was I was really kind of testing I, I was interested in kind of a call and response with a lot of that work um, thinking about the way that rather than working in a kind of studio vacuum that the work I was interested in um, and making was sort of reaching out into the world in certain ways and then and, and then waiting for a response for that world in order f for me to then kind of uh, react again. I think I was definitely interested in the inner workings of these institutional uh, frameworks, in particular the art world and how that, um, how that operated. So un Untitled Auckland Art Gallery dates back to uh, 97 through to 98. Um, and the work started by way of me writing to the Auckland Art Gallery to offer them my services as an undercover security guard. Um, I wrote to them explaining that I was concerned about the safety of these artworks and not just from a, um, the perspective of their, um, their tangible form but also their conceptual reality. So in my letter, I state that you know I had been in the gallery and I had noticed that some people had been spending what I, I deemed to be too long in front of certain artworks, and that I had identified some of these um, these culprits as being students at Elam, the art school at the Auckland University, and that I was concerned that they might be stealing ideas. So um, I offered my services to the Auckland Art Gallery as an undercover security guard to try and police such things. Um, 
so that letter was written and sent to to them and the response came back um you know thank you for your offer of uh free you know free assistance and help to the gallery but you know we uh, are not seeking your your help uh to which i replied um that surely this uh this letter that they had written me needed to be decoded and that i needed some more time to try and decipher the secret message within it and that um i could only assume that they wanted me to go deep cover so to please get in touch so that you know we could start to work out um a program around that um to which i received a response we absolutely do not um request your assistance in, in any um in, in any form uh and then it kind of just went quiet for a little while that was sort of that letter just sort of that was the last letter that just sort of sat there for um some months and then this real really unfortunate and awful event took place at the auckland art gallery where an individual um a, you know rode up to the entryway of the auckland art gallery on a motorbike and jumped off his bike, ran inside with a sh sawn off shotgun and stole a, um, a painting called Still on Top by Tissot. He went to the gallery, ripped it off the wall, cut it out of the frame, rolled it up, got on his bike and left. Um, and this was big news. And of course, it was a it was a, you know, a violent, an act of violence. Um, and it was uh, it was, you know, there was there was also this kind of hunt for the work that took place. And yeah, as, 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 as troubling as that is as an event, as, as, an event, um, as, a, um, as a young troublemaker, I saw this as an opportunity to, um, to somehow, you know, think about this work of my offer of, uh, as an undercover security guard in relationship to this event. So I wrote a letter saying that, you know, had they taken my offer of assistance, this would never have happened, that I would take a bullet for the for the place um uh, at which point uh yeah i was living in a flat on picton street in, in auckland and i was i had a uh, i was working in a cafe i was at my job and i got home and there was a note on the fridge saying that someone named chris sains uh, had ca had called for me and of course i recognized this to be the director of the auckland art gallery so uh, i called him back and i recorded the phone conversation where he you know rightly berates me for my um insensitivity um and so that is then pressed onto 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 a seven inch uh vinyl record um so yeah this is the kind of the yeah this was the the narrative of that work um and you know there are the workers so the work exists as a sequence of letters with a recording of this phone conversation um alongside a sequence of surveillance footage that I took off a screen that was um, you know uh, uh, surveillance footage of the of the uh, of the thief ripping the work off the wall and cutting it, it out of its frame the initial kind of um, drive to write that first letter could never have imagined um, the the work in its final form certainly the events that were completely outside of my control um, were something I, w I took advantage of in a way for this work to kind of evolve and develop um, um, in response to the real world. Private and Confidential is a work that I think grapples with that in a really interesting way. I mean, again, it's an old work, so it's, it's with some distance that I look back at it. So I ended up discovering how they were getting rid of their, their office waste. And... Uh, they were just putting it in a bag next to a public rubbish bin on the street at a given time on a given day. And I would um, wait for that moment and then collect that rubbish and and then take it back to my studio and start to, you know, go through it and make sense of, um, you know, make sense of this, 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 this thrown out material and try and understand the, the, inner, the, inner, the inner workings of this of this organization of this business of this of this this thing the art world and what's really interesting about that act is that actually when someone throws something out they they are legally stating that they no longer seek propriety rights over that material so when you throw something out you're saying i no longer i no longer seek propriety rights that's that's material i no longer want 
And what generally would happen in that instance is that you would have a kind of a contract with either the council who collect that, if it's in a, if it's in a rubbish bin, or with a private company where you, you know where there's a, a you know um, where there's a, a, a container that that rubbish goes into. But it's in that moment that it's also sitting in a strange in-between space, a kind of nowhere, a kind of nowhere land of ownership. Um, and this was very much true of uh, the way that this gallery was disposing of their of their waste because they were just putting it on the side of the street, not in any kind of other bin. And in that moment, they are saying, we no longer seek propriety rights over this. So uh, the ownership of which is kind of very gray, legally speaking. Um, and so, yeah, I collected their rubbish and they found out and they seized the work. I, I showed... I was planning to show it in a, in, a, in a, I think it was at the physics room, I was, going, I was gonna show all of this kind of material and these kind of findings. And I was asked if I would like to have a small show at uh, Room Gallery, which is still operating today, an artist run space in Auckland. And at the time they were in this very strange kind of old dental surgery and there was this sort of reception area in the gallery that had this kind of glass divider where the receptionist would have sat and where the, where the um, patients would wait for their appointment. And on this piece of glass, I stuck all of the post-it notes that were in the bin. You know, there were a lot of these. So there was just kind of this array of post-it notes. So the gallery heard about this and sent um, an individual who works for them, uh, who worked for them at the time, who now was a gallerist in his own right, um, down to, to, to collect the work, to seize it. So I wasn't there at the time, but he, he walked in and seized the work, took it down um, and took it back to the gallery. And a few days later, we were served, uh, we meaning it was served to the gallery on, uh, for me, uh, or to, served to me through the gallery, um, uh, um, legal proceedings. And uh, it was a three-page letter, which is in the exhibition. Um, it's a three-page letter where they're seeking damages. They, you know, they're seeking, um, yeah, all kinds of uh, all kinds of things. And so, but what's really interesting in this letter is that they start to refer to the rubbish as the artwork. So in their, own, in their own definition, they've already kind of acknowledged that this rubbish has been transformed into something else, into an artwork of which the ownership, you know, vests with me. So all of this kind of strange, slippery stuff started to happen with the kind of, um, the, 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 I guess the, the private ownership of what was deemed momentarily public where I, you know, took it. Uh, which so this kind of exchange of privacy kind of takes place through that through inside the work at the same time too, which I think is really interesting. Um, I then had a um, a lawyer uh, who was interested in intellectual property law um, take on this as a pro bono case, and we penned a response. Uh, and in the end, it was a kind of out of court settlement uh, that meant that I returned the rubbish. But of course. Um, you know, the rubbish was now artwork. So there's all this sort of interesting transformation that took place of this material. It was certainly full of subterfuge and um, intrigue and, you know, the, the intensity of receiving a letter as a, you know, a, I was in my early 20s and the kind of, you know, the kind of, the, yeah, the kind of fear and anxiety of that was actually quite intoxicating. Like I really, in making these letter works, I really, I really enjoy I learned to enjoy the, the, the intensity of a moment and the intensity of a moment as it related to an art making methodology that rather than this kind of methodical sort of um, careful sort of approach in a studio to producing meaning, there was this sort of out of control intensity to these moments that would, where works would somehow you know, just kind of arise out of this, out of a, out of out of these decisions, and um, and often, you know, I'd have to make decisions that were good for the work but bad for me, or you know, vice versa, depending on the circumstances. It's been incredibly revealing to do this, to sort of find this thread, or or just or kind of illuminate a thread that. I mean, it sort of sits in the back of your mind, but it's it's not it's certainly not something that is a kind of staged effect through time where these things are logically kind of connected. But it's really interesting to think about this kind of 22 year kind of space where 
there are these really interesting recurring um, habits maybe or interests and so the exhibition's been incredibly um, both useful and interesting to kind of think about those that that a kind of consistency that at the that at the time is quite intuitive like it's not something that is programmatically kind of done it's just something that um, that's kind of set underneath all of this kind of thinking and all of the production that I've been engaged with not all but you know we've kind of looked for that um, retrospectively and found it and that's been really intriguing I mean even just you know formally and visually thinking about the photographs of you know the stack of paper of the rubbish from the gallery in Auckland that I um, that I took from the side of the street and that formally there's this kind of stack of paper we understand these as documents we understand it as detritus or remnants or unwanted withdrawn material and then we see you know from 2002 boxes of shredded material of you know unwanted detritus leftover material um, and then we see in 2019 in Venice this these reams of paper of kind of spent knowledge and that this is this kind of relic produced by a work that reads the names of vanished and gone and disappeared things so so just kind of formally those links are really interesting all of this kind of paper all of these sort of documents all of this sort of um language there's so much kind of language that's present but not language in a in the sense that it's an investigation into kind of the poetics of language but language is kind of data and information so those sorts of co connections have been really interesting to be for, for, to have been revealed for me and hopefully the viewer as well and yeah this interest this ongoing interest in the unseen like all of this all of this uh you know all of these unseen the unseen rubbish from Gal Langsford or the unsaid thing um or the you know the the stated thing that that is a menace and a kind of bureaucratic kind of machine that has to be dealt with or the the the, un, the unseen thing as it as it might relate to something that's vanished from our from our sight i think the the humor in those early letter works there's also a kind of an absurdism in that humor. there's a kind of slightly absurd way to imagine that i that one might think that a student was stealing ideas by looking at something for too long and there is an absurd quality to post hoc that that one could assume to contain and hold all that has gone and vanished, and that's an impossible and probable task. So, the yeah, the the short the the kind of the the external framework of post hoc is full of shortcomings. It's full of it's full of holes and it's full of gaps. And I think it's I think it's that that opens the work up to a possibility for a viewer to find a way in so yeah it's interesting to keep thinking about that i'm still thinking about it